Good afternoon and welcome to the last installment, the last installment of the circuits module of EECS 16A. So now that we are all uh, experts in electronic circuits, let's put that knowledge to use. So let's design something. So uh, before I get into that, I should say that uh, design is a little bit different from analysis. Uh, so far, the course has largely focused on analysis techniques, we have circuits, and we figure out how, to, how, how they work, what voltage that they produce, and so on, so forth. Uh, uh, we also sort of talked a little bit about the design uh, of touch sensors and so on, but uh, today's lecture really will be on design. So the big difference between, or one of the big differences between analysis and design is that analysis is can be a bit challenging, but, but uh, uh, to a good extent, analysis, uh, you can sort of learn recipes like node voltage analysis, and if you know how to use that, and I suggest if you are not completely proficient on that, that you will make sure that you will be proficient by the, by the time of the final. Uh, you, you can have these techniques and you can execute them almost like a computer, right? For design, that's different. It needs all sorts of things, like ideas, creativity, and so on. Of course, because of that, it's very exciting, but it also sometimes can be frustrating, because if I don't have an idea, how am I going to proceed or so? Well, we have lots of things available. Of course, there is experience. You may remember something for, that you have learned in a course, or maybe several courses. Uh, you can go to the web and find out. Maybe there are related things that give you ideas. Uh, you can ask friends. Uh, uh, fora and so on, you can read the literature and so on. But anyways, today we are going to sort of uh, get into this exploratory space of design. So uh, what are we going to design? Well, I didn't get too many requests of, uh, of things to design, and maybe that was good because you could have asked for something that I have no clue how to design, so I picked, I picked something. So we are going to design a rangefinder camera. These, these devices are also known as LiDAR. And we, you may even read about them in the news. For example, the Eiffel-Less course or so use these. Uh, uh, and, uh, and maybe a few years back, you may know uh, there was a was a was a toy or so, whatever, a game. Uh, Microsoft released something called Kinect. It was a camera that actually could could uh, was a rangefinder camera. So, what is a rangefinder camera? Well, you kind of know what a camera is. In fact, you built one in uh, in the uh, first module of this class. A camera is sort of a device that measures the light that it sees, and using that it can record a scene. I don't. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not an artist, right? So uh, it, it records some some scene. It records the amount of light that it gets in various places, pixels or so. Okay, and then it constructs an image out of that. And again, you are very familiar with that because, first of all, most of you have used cameras, probably all of you, and uh, secondly, you even built one in Module 1. So now, what's a rangefinder camera? Well, a, uh, a normal camera, if you want, uh, would just tell for e every pixel how bright or dark it is, or maybe also what color it has. A rangefinder camera says for every pixel how far it is. This one is at one meter, and maybe the nose sticks out, and is at, uh, therefore this is at, at uh, well, if it's Pinocchio, it's uh, 0 0.9 meters. We lied. <laughs> and so on, okay? Right, so that's what the rangefinder is. It, it doesn't, uh, maybe it has also a normal camera, but the, the, the point of the rangefinder camera is that for every pixel, it doesn't say the intensity of light, or the intensity of the scene, it says how far is this pixel away from, from the uh, camera, okay? So uh, we're going to design one of these cameras. 
So what's the first step in designing something? What do we have to first, what do we have to do first? Instead of just drawing a blank. Sometimes called brainstorming, right? We somehow have to come up with some idea. Usually, and we've seen that before, usually our first idea is probably not going to be the best idea or not the ultimate idea or so, but we need to have, need to come up with some ideas that get us started. With, with something that then we can improve, okay? So any ideas on what we could do in order if we wanted to build a camera that measures range? Yeah, okay, back there. Yeah? The okay. Okay, so we need to come up with a working principle for that camera, and then once we have that working principle, we need to, whatever, maybe an algorithm, maybe a circuit, whatever, yeah. Uh, okay, back there. Okay, perfect. So why don't we have, why don't we just take two cameras and they sense the light, and because of the, of the distance of these cameras, they can, uh, can uh, 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 they can infer depth. Have you ever seen such a camera? Yeah, I see a few hundred in front of me. And you see a pair, one. <laughs> okay, so our eyes do exactly that. That's how we perceive distance. Uh, imagine, that, uh, imagine that you're a little airplane that flies along a wall and that wall is big compared to the airplane, it's all white. Is this going to work, that camera? Yeah? Uh, I okay, so let's pause this. There were two things. Uh, one of them is that, uh, 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 no, if, if, it, if you just fly along a white wall, or stereo camera, or both eyes are not going to help. Here you can see this because you see uh, sort of the whole room and stage and different pieces. But if, if all you could look at was the screen, and maybe there wasn't even anything on top of it, that, uh, uh, anything projected, you would not be able to deduce uh, depth. So... Uh, so the other, the other, so, so we're not going to use stereo vision in order to build our depth camera. Uh, now the other idea that uh, we got in that response, well, could we somehow use light? Uh, we send out light to our scene, and then we wait for the light to come back, and we measure how long it takes. Do you think that's a reasonable thing to do? Something like that could work? How long is going to how long will it take for light to, for example, if I have a light beam that goes here to the back of the auditorium and comes back to me, how long will that take? Yes? Perfect. So, so yes, so it's, it's speed of light, uh, speed of light, that what's, that, that, that's the thing. So, so any, anyways, let's, let's maybe in order to uh, answer my question whether we will be able uh, to use that, uh, the, the speed of light, uh, to, to, to build our rangefinder camera, let's, uh, let's calculate how far light goes. So, so we have light. And let's say... Uh, Let's say we had a light, some kind of a light bulb, and uh, that light bulb sends, it sends, blinks and sends out light. It hits a scene, and then that light comes back, and we have some kind of a camera that records the light that comes back. Oh, my, my pictures are not, not terrific. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's figure out how long it takes for the light to make this round trip. Now, obviously, it depends on the distance, so let's make a distance. Uh, our camera is sort of for indoor users, so, so let's make this distance one meter. 
So what would be then the time it takes the light to go from the light bulb, hit the object at one meter distance, and come back to the camera to, to record that uh, flash, okay? So uh, the time, the round trip time, would be equal to two times the distance, let's call this d, divided by the speed of light, sometimes usually called c, okay? So that's two times one meter divided by 300 million meter, meter per second, and uh, this is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So 6.7 billionths of a second. Is this something you think that we can, uh, uh, we can measure? And, and, you know, again, if you want, if this was actually Pinocchio and uh, his, we wanted to know how long his nose is, we want, we probably would have a res wanted to have a resolution of like one centimeter. One centimeter. So then w the, the, the difference in round trip delay is going to be a hundredth of 6.7 billion seconds. Do you think, can you, you have a stopwatch in your smartphone, right? Can you, can you use that stopwatch? What could we use to do this? Electronic circuits, right? We are, of course, way too slow to do this, but electronic circuits, no problem. They can do this, okay? Maybe it requires a little bit work because even your computer may be not quite fast enough, but we can build special circuits and they can do this. So that's a very good idea, and in fact, that's the idea that we are going to use, but just before, it's always helpful to sort of brainstorm a little bit more. Maybe there are other ways to do this also, and sometimes the best, the first idea is ultimately we want, ultimately we want to pursue another one. So any, anybody has an, another idea of what we could do? Yes. Okay, so the proposal is could, we could use sound. Has anybody had experience with sound uh, that goes out and comes back and there is a delay? Yeah, it's an echo, right? Echo. Uh, here, the, we don't have much of an echo because auditoriums, of course, they are designed so they don't get much echo. But uh, if you are in a cave or if you are against a uh, rock wall or so, uh, I'm sure you have uh, noticed that if you shout, then after a while you hear back what you shouted. Okay, so, so uh, it's exactly the same thing as with uh, light, except that uh, sound travels slower, much slower. In fact, uh, 300 meters per second instead of 300 million meters per second, so a million times slower. Okay, so we could actually use either. Uh, in fact, does anybody have an idea? Does anybody know of something or somewhere where sound is used? to measure depths, yes. Bats, exactly. Bats, they do precisely that. Uh, another, uh, another application that maybe you even have experienced yourselves, yeah? Exactly, ultrasound, right? Ultrasound, uh, you may have seen, seen uh, may, may, maybe there is, you, you have any photo album, I have a photo album of my kids, and in there, there are pictures of them and they're still inside the womb, not mine, my, my wife's. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so ultrasound. Uh, it turns. So, so we are going to use light. Uh, one of the reasons we are going to use light is that with ultrasound, it's very interesting, but it's a bit challenging to do all the signal processing to actually make a real image out of what we what we get out of the ultrasound measurement system. With light, it's a little bit easier. So we are going to stick with light. But ultrasound is uh, is another good idea. In fact, why do we use ultrasound and not just normal sound? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It would be pretty annoying if, I were <laughs> if everybody used uh, an ult a, a, a sound sort of ranger. It would be very noisy, right? Uh, so uh, uh, also the properties also are, are a bit different. So we can actually get better resolution with ultrasound than with uh, the sound that uh, sort of we can generate. Yes, back there.
Oh, that's a terrific question. How do we know that the light that reaches the camera is actually the light that we sent out with our light bulb but not some other light? Okay. So that's a good question. So, so you know there are different light bulbs. For example, you can have a red light bulb or you could have a blue or a green light bulb, right? Uh, are there other light bulbs you can imagine? Yeah. And, and, yes? Exactly, infrared is a good one. Uh, infrared, uh, can you see that? No, you cannot see it. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so infrared also is a good choice for this because uh, you can illuminate the scene and uh, your camera can see it, but the people around it cannot see that. Actually, it's a good, both a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is if the, ultra, uh, if the infrared light is strong, it hits your eyes, you don't even notice, you don't close them, and, uh, and uh, that damages the eyes. So we, have, we cannot use too high, camera, uh, too, too high a, a power, but, uh, but uh, we can use this, uh, this, uh, this, excuse me, this uh, infrared light, uh, so we can't see that. So, uh, uh, so getting back to that question, well, how can we be sure uh, that, uh, that it's actually the light that we sent from our camera, not some other light that... Uh, that we sent from our bulb, but not some other light that uh, hits our camera and that we uh, that we record. Well, uh, we, 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 I mean, generally, what we what we will do in this particular case will work is that we use light where there isn't too much of it, anyways, around. So uh, infrared that works pretty well for that purpose, except outdoors. And in fact, if any of you has played with this Kinect camera or has one, uh, go and use it outdoors and it will not work, or not work very well, because of the sun. Okay? Uh, but, uh, but, uh, 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 but, but indoors or so, we can make that work. And there are also ways to make it work outdoor, more or less. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging. So, uh, so that's what we're going to do. Oh, that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use so much uh, infrared light that uh, the infrared light that we get some f from other sources is kind of negligible. Okay? So it, you know, that's the only thing that we have to deal with. Okay, so uh, we are ready now to uh, design our camera. So just like for the touch sensor, we are going to design one pixel. And once we figured out how to Design that one pixel, we are going to do something to make lots of pixels, okay? And we'll talk about that then. All right, so... Uh, so we are going to have a uh, light bulb. And actually for the light bulb, we are going to not going to use incandescent, but we are going to use an LED or a laser. Okay? So, and the reason we do that is we want to be able to send out a very brief, very short pulse of light. So the blink very quick, very rapidly. And with an incandescent bulb, and I guess there are there probably not any left here, uh, that wouldn't be possible. But uh, with lasers in particular, we can make pulses that are very short. Right? Very high intensity and very short. That also uh, is good because it doesn't hurt the eyes if it's very short. Uh, the energy is not very high. Okay, so we're going to emit this light. So the light is going to be, as a function of time, the light pulse is going to look something like this. So light intensity. The light intensity is going to look something like this. Okay? And uh, we're going to make sort of a pulse of a fixed intensity that has a certain duration. We call that T0. Okay? That's what we're going to use to illuminate our scene. The, uh, this light then travels to our scene. Well, maybe... Maybe I'll draw this on the same scale. Same, same. Okay. So the, the light travels to the scene. Let's, let's put that over here. That's Pinocchio or whatever. We want to image. Uh, 
And so the pulse ultimately comes here, hits, hits this, and then it comes back. And when we record it, when we record it, so this receiver What we record is going to look like this. Okay. It's going to look like this, where TD is the delay that the light incurred getting to the object and back. Okay? So, so we need now something else, so we, here we need a source. That's our, uh, that's our LED or laser, right? We're going to use a source, and then afterwards we also need a receiver. And uh, oddly enough, well, a, a receiver turns out is something uh, it's sometimes called a photodiode. It's very similar to an LED, but but uh, it acts like a current source. It puts out a current, I light, uh, that is proportional to the intensity of the light that we, uh, that we received. So, uh, so uh, if, if this light, this light here, if this light hits our photodiode, If it hits our photodiode, then we are going to get a current. Let's call this I diode. That uh, is going to be proportional to the intensity of the light received. So now, because we don't have much or any light, uh, except when a pulse comes, reflected from Pinocchio, then uh, uh, we get this pulse of current. Okay? And we also arrange it that uh, we make it that uh, the intensity of the light we send out is constant over the duration of our pulse. And consequently, the current also is going to be constant over the duration of the pulse and pretty close to or, or zero otherwise. And now I'm warming up again. So. <laughs> yes, teaching... Uh, Teaching is work, apparently. Okay, so. So, now, our next step is we want to measure something. What do we want to measure? We want to measure the distance, but uh, what could we possibly measure? Right, we cannot measure the distance directly, but from, from these diagrams, is there something in these diagrams that we would like to know? And if we knew that, we could figure out that, yes. Time, exactly. In particular, this TD, this time delay. How long has this uh, pulse been delayed? Okay. So now, we have to come up with an idea on how to do this. And... Uh, in order to perform a measurement, we haven't really dwelt too much on this, but you need some energy uh, to perform a measurement. They tell you that in physics. So, uh, so if you look at this, then uh, the length of this part of the pulse, basically how long it extends beyond the time where we sent or where we actually send our pulse, is also TD, right? And so this area that I hash in red is proportional to this time TD. If uh, TD was longer, if the, the, the object was farther away, well, then this would be, the pulse would be delayed more and uh, it would look something like this, right? And uh, so the, uh, the red area then also would be, would be correspondingly larger for a longer delay. So what we apparently uh, can do if we want to measure TD is we can measure the uh, area of this uh, pulse. Okay. So uh, how are we going to do that? Well, uh, out of our photodetector, 
we are getting out the current. Okay? And how can, what would be this, this, what is this thing here? This area here, it has length, duration, TD, and it has height, let's call this IX or so, the received amount of current. What's time, TD, times IX? That is charge, I think I've heard. So, uh, let me see what nomenclature I use here. So, now let's say, let's call this, this here is Q1. So the charge that we have received, Q1 is equal to TD, which is what we would like to know, and IX. And TD is going to be equal to two times the distance divided by the speed of light, and again times IX. Okay? So, how could we measure this uh, charge, Q1? Do you know of an electronic circuit that can measure? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we can use a capacitor. So let's, let's try to do this with a capacitor. So uh, I'm going to just draw our current source, the... Uh, photodiode. Okay. And then we want to send this to a capacitor, this current. Let's call this capacitor C1. And... Uh, so the current here that's flowing here is Ix, and I left a little gap because we need to do one more thing in this circuit. One more thing. If we just connected these, what area would we measure? Well, we would measure the entire, the entire charge that is received. In other words, we me would measure the duration of the whole pulse, which is, we said before, TD, the T, T0. I wrote this up here. Right? So we don't want that. We know what T0 is. That's how long we made our pulse, right? We don't want T0. We want to have just TD. So how could we arrange it so that we're just going to measure the red hashed area? Yes. Ah, uh, exactly. We're going to use a switch here. S1. And that switch, S1, well, we are going to have the, the light pulse, sort of uh, the pulse. Uh, the pul pulse that we, that we applied to our... Uh, to our LED or laser, okay? It looks like this, and it has a duration T0. And then we generate another pulse that we apply to switch S1, and that pulse is going to be precisely shifted. It's the same length, but it's shifted by T0, and this aligns, okay? So now... When we have the received light, ID, that one is going to, before I had that in, well, that is going to be T, that's going to be this, delayed by TD, and the duration, of course, is also T0. So this is the time TD here. And, uh, well, this also is TD, maybe this one. And uh, the switch is closed during, from here to here, the switch is closed, so we're going to start measuring here, we're going to start look at charge here, we're going to stop looking at charge here, 
Well, but the only charge that you actually get is this one, right? Because of afterwards it's zero. And if the delay was larger, well, then simply we would, we would get a bit more charge. If the delay was shorter, we would get a little bit less charge. So this is how we control our switch, S1. We need to make these pulses. For example, we could make a, a pulse of duration 100 nanoseconds here. And then simply would make, once we're done with that pulse, we generate a second pulse of also 100 nanoseconds, 100 millionths of a second, billionths of a second duration, and uh, we use that to control the switch. Okay? And of course, we have to first discharge the capacitor. Yes? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, like, like always, your, your colleague is, is very right. So we came up with an idea that looks great, and then there is a, there is a hair in this soup. The, the height of this, we had called somewhere else, we had called this Ix. Also depends on the distance of how far my thing is away. I mean, if it, that goes all the way to the moon, probably less light comes back if, than if it only has to go for a meter or two. It also depends on the reflectivity of the object. If you have a mirror, probably more light gets reflected than if it's a dark sort of absorbing surface, like black or so. So there are some, some issues we need to take care of. Yes? Okay, so uh, here we have a proposal for a solution. Maybe somehow could arrange it with an op-amp or something, make it that this Ix is always the same. Uh, I think there's somebody else back there had a hand up. Yes? I, I, I did not hear what you I'm still... <laughs> Yeah. Isn't there a project in the field that we can search it? Is it like okay, okay, okay. So, uh, so the question is, if you're, if you're trying to detect things that happen at the speed of light, isn't then there a delay in the circuit that sort of makes it impossible or maybe at least inaccurate when we make our measurement? Anybody has an idea about that? So we haven't actually talked about that, but uh, uh, what's the speed at which electrical signals propagate? At what speed do they go? So this is a little bit of physics, but electrical signals are, electro are actually electromagnetic waves. And, uh, and uh, light, that's also an electromagnetic wave. So it's really the same thing. It's a different frequency. Light is a higher frequency than the electrical signals that we're using, but it's basically the same thing. It's electromagnetic signals, and so they actually go at the same speed of light. Not quite, because in, 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 a, in a medium, light or electromagnetic signals travel a little bit slower, but, you know, they go half the speed or so. So, uh, because our electronic circuit is relatively small compared to the object and the distance that we are trying to measure, uh, that delay inside the circuit is either negligible or we can sort of deal with it, okay? But it's a very interesting question, and if you're building a fast computer, you better do not forget the fact that signals, they don't travel instantaneously, they go at about the speed of light, and there is going to be a delay. You can calculate, actually, actually the delay uh, over a foot is one, one billionth of a second. So uh, if you build a computer, then, uh, then uh, the, the, the delay gets really appreciable. Uh, you, need to, you need to consider, the, you need to take this into account when you design things. But here we are fine because what we are trying to measure is relatively big, 
and our electronic circuit is relatively small, so it should be okay. But it's a very good point. Okay. Where have we been? Yes, we have been with this problem of this, this current Ix is proportional to light intensity, and the light intensity varies on all sorts of stuff that unfortunately doesn't have much to do with... Uh, doesn't uh, that that that, yeah, oh, that 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 foils our measurement? That foils our measurement. That also has to do with that, that that also has to do with distance, but it also has to do with reflectivity and all sorts of stuff that uh, uh, makes it that our measurement is not going to be accurate. So uh, how could we fix that? So there have been suggestions. We could somehow try to make it that i x is always constant, and. Yes, you could try to do that. Uh, we could, for example, use a comparator. If we receive at least a certain amount of light, then we uh, say we get maybe uh, one milliamp or something like that, and otherwise we make the current equal to zero or so. It turns out doing this thing so fast is actually difficult. So uh, you could try that, but uh, it would be hard. It would be actually hard to do. So uh, the other the other idea is that if we could somehow measure, if we somehow could measure what i x is. So and uh, turns out that 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 also is difficult because we have to measure this intensity very quickly, and so that's hard. But what we can measure is we could also measure this area here, right? So now we measure the area separately. We me measure this area here. I, sh I guess I should have used a different color. We measure the red area, and then we also measure the green area. How would you do that? Yes. Or oh, maybe back there. I'm not sure whether I followed that. Uh, uh, if, if yeah, we somehow could, maybe we could add them together or so. Uh, let's, let's, let's actually try to really measure, measure the green area. We already know how to measure the red area. Let's try to measure the green area also. How would we do that? Well, all we need is apparently a different signal to control another switch. So let's actually put that down here. Time. And we put the switch 2, and that switch 2 is controlled like this. Now, when we get the pulse first, we get nothing. And then, then starting here, we get just this charge. We get the green charge, which is precisely what we want to know. Right? Yes. Uh, okay, so the idea is that uh, we would first... Uh, maybe uh, accumulate charge, and then we would dump charge or so. We would flip the sign of the current. Uh, that's an idea. We could try that. I haven't thought of that, so uh, so uh, I, I, want to, I want to stick with what I know that works <laughs> because I, I tried this, or, or at least I designed this beforehand, but that's a good idea. May, maybe there would be some advantages in doing, doing it the way you propose. Okay? Okay, uh, but now let's design the, our new circuit that has two switches. So there's still the switch S1 that's controlled by the signal S1 in, in the, uh, the, the other diagram. And there is a capacitor C1. And then there is also going to be a switch S2 that's controlled by that other signal. And, well, there is another capacitor 
Could be, could be different, but uh, let's just use the same value. We'll see afterwards that that, that works just fine. And uh, that's our photodiode. Okay? So uh, we've already calculated the, the charge Q1. The charge Q1 that we get there, and uh, that is equal to, that was equal to uh, I diode, or I X times T D, and uh, uh, T D is two uh, D, two uh, D over C times I X, right? And uh, now we get also a charge Q two, and that is equal. Well, how long is the green? How long is the green? The green pulse. Well, the green pulse is going to be T0, the length, the duration of the pulse that we send out. This is T0, minus TD. Okay. If we had no delay, if TD was 0, of course, we would get the, get the pulse that we send out back right away, and we would integrate that whole pulse. If the delay is large, equal to T0, we wouldn't get anything, and something in between. Okay, so that's going to be equal to IX, times T0 minus TD. Okay? So then we actually, actually what, what we are going to measure is not charge, what we are going to measure is voltage. So we have here V1 and, and, uh, and over here we have V2. Okay? So, uh, V1 is going to be equal to Q1 over C1. To be careful, there is the C1, that's the capacitance, and lowercase c, well, that's the speed of light, so there are two c's. And uh, this uh, V2 is going to be equal to Ix divided by C1 times T0 minus Td. So this one here was uh, Ix times Td over C1. Okay, so uh, what we want to do now is... Um, V2 is yeah okay so uh, so now we basically have two equations V1 and V2 both are known V1 and V2 are known and we have how many unknowns well we have the unknown TD TD that's what we want to figure out. And the other unknown here is Ix. Right? We also have, uh, in our equation, we have C1. Well, but C1, we know what it is. We, we can choose a capacitor. And we have T0. That's also something that we know. Okay? So we have two equations, two unknowns, and uh, we can solve these for, uh, well, T, Td is... We can solve them for TD, and TD is equal to, to uh, 2 times the distance divided by the speed of light. Okay? So we solve these. turns out it's very simple. We, we just can, uh, we, we, we can uh, solve for that. But anyways, let me, let me write down the, uh, the solution. D, if we solve this, is going to be equal to the speed of light times T0 divided by 2, that's this 2 that we get here, times V1 over V1 plus V2. Okay? That's what you get if you solve this, this equation. Yeah. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so the question is, uh, if you're sending, uh, if you're se the, the, the sort of two things, uh, we could be sending out many pulses, and we could also be receiving many pulses. And if that happens, then it could get a bit confusing and we may not be able to reconstruct the image. That's a very valid concern. So the first part, sending out many pulses, well, we could send out the pulse, do our measurement and so on. When you're done, we send out a new pulse, okay? So then there is no confusion. Agreed? Okay. However, uh, the other problem that we would be getting multiple pulses back, that is actually harder to deal with. Imagine that you were trying to measure the distance from, from your camera to a tree. Well, what's a tree? It's a whole pile of leaves, right? And so a pulse may be hitting sort of half a leaf and the other part of the pulse misses the leaf, right? Because the pulse, the size, it's much like a laser point. It's a little bit bigger than the leaf. And, and that pulse goes farther, maybe hits a leaf that is farther back or hits the stem of the tree. And then we get some, some kind of a mix, okay? So it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And, uh, and uh, in fact, interpreting these images uh, is a bit of a challenge, and there is quite a bit of signal processing involved in doing that. Okay? And, uh, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, you're getting an EECS degree, because uh, you have to learn about circuits, a little bit of physics here also. You have to learn about signal processing. How do we make how to reconstruct an image and make that, that it's robust and uh, contains the right information, maybe reject stuff that obviously is incorrect. And uh, then, of course, you need to also know programming, computers, and so on, to deal with these images, okay? Incidentally, machine learning, which is going to be the next module, is one of the techniques that can be used to interpret this image, like to recognize different objects, because machine learning can... Uh, just like humans can deal with sort of variations uh, rel quite efficiently. Yes, there was a question here. So, do we actually end up having both images, or we are pretending like between the camera and both images? Like, uh, okay, so the question is, are we going to measure two voltages, V1 and V2, or are we going to somehow connect them cleverly, and uh, then, you know... You actually can do either, in principle, but calculating the ratio with an analog circuit is not impossible, but it's a bit tricky. So I would suggest that we measure with the voltmeter, very fast voltmeter, but that's possible. We measure both of these voltages, and then we use a computer, well, not a computer, we use a digital circuit that uh, makes this calculation here and gets us the distance. We measure both the V1, we use two voltmeters, we measure V1, we measure V2, and then we make this calculation. Yeah. That's, that's most likely. That's, that's how I've seen, I actually built such a camera in my lab, and uh, that's how we did it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so there are many en enhancements and things that we can, we, we can do to this, uh, but, uh, uh, let, let me sort of leave it at this. Uh, we can, we can obviously using this circuit, we can generate these two voltages, V1 and V2. We can measure them, and then we can perform this computation, and we get the distance. Okay. So uh, uh, once we have that, we get the uh, uh, we get the distance for a single pixel. And uh, I told you that. Uh, we did this in my lab. We built a camera like this. How, how do you do this? Well, uh, you build... Things have to go very, very fast. So you cannot build a very large kind of a, uh, a system because then, as, as some of you pointed out, the speed of light becomes a problem. So we built actually an integrated circuit. We built this on silicon. I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, there are... Uh, 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 there are just the electronics are all here. Uh, we had a second chip... Actually, we had the second chip that did all the optics, that routed all the optical signals around and uh, had the photo detector and so on. 
Then we stacked them on top of each other and we made it that they nicely aligned so they didn't have to put all these wires and so on. Again, we want to make it fast. And uh, here it's from the side. From the side you see the, the, uh, the lower chip, the electronics, and the upper chip here the, uh, with the photodiode and stuff. And they're connected with these, uh, these are actually uh, aluminum or copper sort of stems, vias, between them. And then we tried it this camera, and uh, as I mentioned, we, we did a few more tricks that I didn't talk about now, uh, and we found that our camera worked very, very well, in particular, it was very, very precise. We could, we could, uh, we could detect micron, micron size differences in distance, so this is very accurate. So, uh, uh, as a demonstration, we took a gear, we bought a little gear, and we imaged that gear with our camera. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we got a measurement accuracy on the order of 10 micron. 10 micron, that's about a tenth, a tenth of the diameter of a hair. This is very accurate. So afterwards, a large company, they said, hey, we need this, and they made a product out of it. So, uh, so now uh, here, We've said we made a, a chip out of this. Well, what is a chip? Well, chips are electronic circuits that are built of, on wafers. These things are, it's a silicon, there's a silicon wafer, it's a uh, material, yeah, it's a periodic table, a wafer, and uh, you can build a lot of electronic circuits on one of these wafers. In fact, there is a machine that it's a little bit like a printing machine that can print the electronic circuits. The machine is pretty big, the size of a couple of football fields, and it's somewhat expensive. But in the end, you get all of these uh, all of these electronic circuits on this. Uh, here is another one of these wafers, a smaller one, and. Uh, you cannot see this very well from back there, but uh, here there are actual actual circuits, and you, if you look carefully, you can see that the, the real structures and their electronic circuits. Now, because you can't see this from back there, I will pass this through through uh, the uh, the lecture hall. So you can pass this through, and you can look at it. So there are two things. One of them is a big bigger wafer, eight inch diameter, and uh, Please leave it in inside the uh, the enclosure. Unfortunately, you don't see that much interesting stuff here. Just this is how it looks. This is how it comes out of the machine. And then there is the smaller wafer, and there you can uh, you can actually see a little bit the structures. Okay. Uh, once you have these wafers, you will see there are lots of sort of rectangles with the individual chips. Each chip is a full circuit. You use a saw. Cut them apart and maybe package them, and there you have your your uh, electronic circuits. Okay, so uh, so this you want to open so you can see something. Just be careful if you drop it; it will probably shatter. <laughs> and then your colleagues have only pieces to look at, only shards to look at. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the question is, these wafers, where we built these electronic circuits off, they seem to be always round. Okay, so uh, they're, they're not rectangular ones. So, so two things, first of all, why are they round? Well, uh, silicon, silicon is a material, actually it's a glass is silicon dioxide. So it's an abundant material on the earth, but uh, in order to make chips, we need very, very pure silicon. And the way we do that, essentially there is a little bit more stuff involved with it, but what we do is we melt, we melt it, and then we pull it like a candle. Maybe some of, who has, who has actually ever, ever pulled a candle? Right? So, and the, the, that comes out round, okay? So, so these, uh, uh, mo it's actually mostly done by companies in Japan. They make these, uh, it's called ingots, they are big like this and very heavy, and they are round, they come out of molten silicon. Don't put your hand, it's very hot. Okay? Okay. But that's how we make it that it's very, 
very clean. Okay? So they come out round. So the second part of the question is, if you have an idea on how to make rectangular shaped ingots, you're a hero. And one big application would be solar cells. Solar cells would rather like them to be rectangle or, or square shaped so we can pack them more densely. And you will see they actually have, usually they have the corners rounded a little bit, but the, but the top and sides, they're, they're even. So they, they simply take wafers and cut pieces off to make them more or less rectangular. But it's a good question, yes. Okay, uh, there was a question back there. No? Okay. Okay, so while you're looking at these uh, wafers, uh, so let's talk just a little bit about what you would do if you wanted to build now such a camera. Well, there are a few more. Uh, obviously, you will next or more circuits. There's going to be more circuit 16B. Some of you will, I hope most of you will love this. Some of them maybe. <laughs> but anyways, there's going to be, you get some more circuits anyways. But if you, uh, to build such a camera, you need to know more. So first, you need to know more about devices. In particular, you need to know about transistors. LEDs, things like that. Fortunately, here at Berkeley, of course, we have a course for this. It's called EE 130, and the title is Integrated Circuit Devices. And an integrated circuit is an electronic circuit that is built on one of these wafers that I've shown you, okay, that you're looking at. So uh, this EE130 uh, will teach you a whole lot about how these devices actually work, how they how they're made, uh, uh, yeah, well, how they work, actually. There is another course that some of you may find very exciting. I took that, I found that. It's sort of a cooking co class almost. Uh, 143, and that is microfabrication. You don't make your own wafer there. You don't make that silicon stuff and so on. You don't melt the silicon. But you take, you, you take a wafer and then you go through all this, uh, again, it's a little bit like printing, more sophisticated, and you actually make electronic circuits, okay? So we have a course for that. Uh, there is a lab in Cory Hall. When you enter Cory Hall on the second floor, you see yellow windows. Behind that is the teaching lab. And then there is also another lab uh, in Sutarcha Dai Hall, be sort of between Kori and, uh, and Soda Hall, where we have a more fancy lab, where we are building a lot of, a lot of um, uh, electronic circuits. The world's smallest transistor for some time was built there, okay, for example. Okay, so devices, uh, these would, there are more, more courses on devices, but these would be two that uh, are important. Then obviously you need, you want to know more about circuits. And for circuits there are two flavors. One of them is analog circuits. Analog circuits, so those are the circuits that we mainly concerned ourselves with in 16A, and where the voltage is they very, very uh, uh, sort of over an entire span of numbers. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the course for that is called EE105. Uh, micro, microelectronic devices and circuits. Okay. And then there is a digital one. So there you learn how to build a computer 
to design your own computer that has its own instruction set and everything in memory and whatever you want. But you also will learn how to build stuff like uh, all these pulses that control the switches in, uh, in, in this camera. Because there, if you just build a computer and program it with Python or whatever, it's going to be way too slow, okay? But you can, there, you, in, in this course, you're going to learn how to build a digital circuit that can be very fast and does exactly what you want it to do. So that's how it can be fast. So that course is EECS 151, and the title is Digital Design and Integrated Circuits. So we love, we love integrated circuits, so I want to repeat, repeat that. Okay. So, uh, so these are courses that you might consider, and obviously then there are other ones, and, but, but uh, this would be a good start. Uh, signals. In the, in the, the signals courses, they teach you stuff like, for example, how do I deal with a measurement that isn't really quite ac quite what I want? Like, like a colleague of you pointed out, well, you know, when we are receiving that light, we might actually get different pieces of light with various delays, and that makes our image not quite, uh, quite perfect quality. Well, in, uh, in signal processing, has a whole pile of techniques on how to deal with this and other uh, other problems. Make basically extract useful information out of imperfect signals. That's one of the things. Describe signals better, so on. So, so uh, a good starter course would be EE120, and uh, it's called Signals and Systems. It also tells you much about much more powerful ways on how to describe signals, okay? And then do calculations with them. And then, of course, there is computing. Uh, in the 61 A, B, C series, you learn a lot about computers and programming and so on, and that is going to be very helpful, and you're taking that anyways. And then there are, of course, also other techniques, like we've mentioned, machine learning, AI or so, that, for example, are used to, once you have that image, well, how do I now recognize that I have Pinocchio or something else? Or how could I figure out from the image how long Pinocchio's nose is? Okay? So, uh, 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 there are lot, many courses or so that sort of help uh, in dealing with questions like this, okay? So those are, that's kind of a sort of a, uh, a perspective of how you would design such a stuff. Now, now you can imagine that these are quite many courses and, uh, and uh, typically uh, uh, electrical engineers, we know a bit about every piece. Why? Well, because if we want to build such a camera, well, we need to know about a lot of things. But then we specialize in one area. Some of you may like this. Well, then you take more courses in this area. No, enough about the other part that you can design a camera or so, but then you get together with somebody who builds the circuits. And, of course, if you're like me, you're going to learn a lot more about circuits, take many more courses there. You're going to do that, and you get other folks to help you with the other parts. Okay? So are there any more questions about circuits or design or courses to take. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> Which one's better? What, whatever you like best, you know? Some people, they like, some people like me, I like circuits, then sometimes I'm repeating, I hate circuits. And, uh, and others, they like computers. Whatever. This, that's, that's, that's the beauty of it, yes. <laughs> Analog and digital signals. Analog signals are sort of the signal that we, signals we get from the physical world. Like light intensity varies from zero to you know, no light to very bright, blinding light. Right? And, 
And uh, computers, they deal with the so-called digital signals, binary signals that are only zeros and ones. They're also perhaps represented by voltages, but then the voltage is either zero or one volt, for example. Okay? So that's how, it, how the digital signals are represented. You will learn a little bit more about that in 16b and then uh, also in 61c. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between EE105 and 140? Well, 140 follows uh, 105. In 105, you learn about basic transistor circuits. In 140, you learn how to design operational amplifiers. Okay, all those elements that we talked about in the last two lectures. Yes, back there. Yes, if you want to build uh, other systems like photolithography systems, uh, there is a course 143 called Fundamentals of Photovoltaic Devices. Uh, I guess you may be not able to read this. I'm not sure whether this shows. But yeah, one, one, 134. And of course, then there are also computer graphics courses, uh, how to evaluate this, uh, uh, how to process that data. Any more questions? If not, yes. Which courses talk about quantum computing? Uh, there are courses in CS uh, on quantum computing, but I'm not familiar with the, with the numbers and names. So, but if you go to the course catalog, which is accessible from the EECS website, that gives you specific courses in our department, you'll find them there. And I would imagine that the physicists probably have courses on that topic also. CS191, apparently. Okay, thank you. So, all right. So, that's circuits. That's a circuit module for for 16A, and I hope you enjoyed it, or at least tolerated it. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, uh, well, I wish you good luck in your future careers. We will see each other also on the on the uh, final exam and the next module, Professor Prof uh, 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 Professor Ronaldo is going to teach, and it's going to be machine learning. So, uh, have a wonderful time. <laughs>